One, two, three. Dance Queen! I'm a dancer. And I'm a traveler. And wherever I go, I experience the world one dance at a time. I'm Michaela Malazzi, and this is Bare Feet in NYC. Bare Feet is supported in part by... Bloomberg Connects gives you a way to experience the arts from your mobile phone. You can explore hundreds of cultural organizations from around the world, anytime, anywhere. Learn more at BloombergConnects.org or wherever you find your apps. Welcome to Harlem, a diverse and culturally rich neighborhood in New York City. Located just north of Central Park in Manhattan, Harlem's historically artistic boom runs back to the turn of the 20th century. African Americans fled north from the Southern Jim Crow laws in the early 1900s and settled in this area with their new Jewish and Italian neighbors. The 1920s and 30s was a period of prolific artistic work from the African American community, which was then called the Harlem Renaissance, and was sparked by the recovery efforts after World War I. On this Bare Feet in NYC adventure, I dig into the history of America's artistic and cultural hub, discover how it has grown, and see where it continues to flourish today. My first stop is to West 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue at the Harlem School of the Arts. This art center is the epitome of the creative fiber that runs through Harlem, offering classes in dance, music, visual arts, and theater for children and adults. The school was founded in 1964 and has been an institution here in Harlem ever since, acting as an incubator for renowned artists and companies, including the Dance Theater of Harlem. Harlem School of the Arts was founded in 1964. Uh, we are multidisciplinary. Essentially, we're an art center. Mm -hmm. Dorothy Maynard uh, was our founder. Uh, she was an alto soprano opera singer. She was an African-American yeah. woman. She was not allowed to perform in America, and she performed all over Europe. And she was an amazing woman who had an amazing vision. This building was built to be what it is. Uh, this wasn't a former public school or anything like that. It was built to be an art center. We're really looking to make this place a cultural hub for the arts, essentially, where people can come and take part in dance, music, theater, and visual arts. Uh, we're rooted in programming for children, but we're also looking to really grow our adult programming as well, where it's something for the entire family. took a drumming class with four to six-year-olds. And they are going nuts, but they're making music. Like These yeah. kids are incredible. They have wonderful ears. And they're working with a master drummer. Baba Don uh, was, a, 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 was or still is a member of The Last Poets. the four C's. The arts are, you know, it helps you in terms of your critical thinking, your creative thinking, your ability to communicate and to work collaboratively yeah. with others. And that essentially is, uh, you know, uh, the framework for 21st century education. No, I have an 11 and a 14 year old. I have no idea what's going to exist job wise. So they have to be able to think right. and be able to adjust. And the arts is a perfect place in terms of, you know, kids getting that because too often, People just think that art is for the talented child. Well, it's beyond that. My daughters did soccer, not because they were gonna be Mia Hamm, because it was healthy. You know, it doesn't matter if a person can sing or they can draw. Being engaged and being, you know, having their, their, their mind and their ideas, you know, able to stretch how they think and how they problem solve is important. I jump in with Aubrey Lynch, dance director here at HSA, who gives me a taste of the dance curriculum that the kids get here every day. A 
one and a two and a three and a four. This comes from Jack Cole. You'll see it in Diamonds Are Our Girl's Best Friend. Here we go, and a one. And a one. I dare you to lift your chin. Five, six, here we go. Started off right. as simple choreography. Yes. So and then we say, add a, add an element of, yes, of a face. Cardboard, yeah. yeah. The secret I learned from Lion King is you have to look at the puppet. And every now and then, check out the audience. You bring it to life by looking at the puppet and at yourself. So you want to put it in front of you, because the aunt's, what Julie Timmer did was she could look at the puppet or the person or both. So what we're doing is I'm trying to uh, teach the children that dance is a language, right? And you, but to speak the language, you got to speak it clearly, articulately. Plie, tendu, and know the history. Along with the technical dance training, Aubrey also teaches the students the history of the dance pioneers so that they learn about their own dance and arts ancestry. Modern dance from Lester Horton, Jose Limon, and Martha Graham, jazz from Alvin Ailey and Jack Cole, and the list goes on. You gotta learn the language clearly and articulately first. So we make sure they're proficient in ballet, modern, jazz, hip hop, tap, and African. It's a lot, right? Yes. And they take it on. Some of them sing, some of them can act, some of them draw, so there's a lot of stuff. Right. So in this class, we bring it all together, and we add story, which we add the visual art component, mm -hmm. so that the audience does the work for you. As long as you tell them it's an elephant, it's an elephant. If it's a god or goddess, it could be a piece of cardboard painted with tape, and, and it becomes a light, it becomes a god or a goddess. Learn the language first, before you add the elements. When you add the elements, you add the elements, and then you can um, tell a story. We're searching for hope in the forest. Look to the west, and the east, and the sky, and the earth. Look to your right, and your left. What's that? What's that? What's that? Celebrate, they've arrived. Five, six, five, six, seven, go, da. Yes, yes, there is hope. <laughs> just the energy when I come in here um, with open arms, everyone just sort of is like, yes, try this class, try this class. And it seems like a wonderful place to be creative, to learn, and also their structure. And sort of what you describe feeling, that is amazing to walk into yeah. on a daily basis. We really are looking to really just make this place as robust as possible and make it a cultural destination for Harlem where people of Harlem can come together. And if you're interested in culture, there's gonna be something for adults, there's gonna be something for kids, there's gonna be something for teenagers. It's a little something for everybody. It's incredible. Harlem has become a destination for families, creatives, and of course, tourists. Its rich history is still very much alive while the community continues to evolve. I meet with John Reddick, local historian and collector of memorabilia from the booming Harlem Renaissance era. I meet him at Sette Pani on the corner of 120th and Malcolm X Boulevard. This cafe is currently the home to John's extensive sheet music collection, a perfect backdrop to learn more about the history of this beautiful neighborhood. John, as you walk in, you see beautiful old musical covers. Sheet music. Sheet music. This is your they private mind, collection. my private collection. Yeah. And they really try to tell a story about what the content of the music is. So you got some social history, you get artistic history, and you can see how they were influenced by the music, how they evolve in writing, making images for the music evolves their art. The six people we see in the middle are the work of Sidney Leff. On the top row are some of his early pieces. And for Irving Berlin, you see it's a very standard image, nothing very sort of innovative. But when you go to the bottom row, now he's doing images around um, the club scene that was Harlem. This is during the Prohibition uh, period. But you start to see him now become much more angular. And you can see in the rhythmatic one in particular, this very angular motion. So I mean, as an artist, he wasn't doing what I was saying before, the stereotypical, just drawing what the stereotype would put forward. He actually had to have been looking at the dancers and picking up on the angularity of the uh, movement. 
I'm actually working on a book, and it features this dialogue between the blacks and the Jews in Harlem. In my research, I'm really seeing in all these different aspects, I could take the black writer and the Jewish writer and see psychologically what they were trying to do to advance their, their issues in the, in the culture. So the American Songbook, all the players in the American Songbook, Gershwin, Richard Rodgers, Oscar Hammerstein, they all grew up in Harlem. And the music, of the hip hop music of their day was ragtime. Right. And they were really connecting with the beat of that period, which was ragtime, but also really kind of like coming up with the storyline. And both groups are outsiders to the American culture. And so by writing music as an outsider, in a certain way, they're touching everybody. Now our first stop is, this is, was a synagogue. This was a synagogue. You can still see the Star of David in the capital of the column there, if you go way up to the center. But it was yeah. converted? And now, no, now it's a uh, Baptist church. From the 1920s on, it was a Baptist uh, church, but it's still laid out like a synagogue, and where the ark was now is where they do their baptism. And the Grand Boulevard, we're on Lenox Avenue, uh -huh. and was really laid out in the period of the sort of bazaar, like the French Boulevard, which you don't see in other parts of New York City. Right, right. And these old buildings, the, the brownstones are gorgeous. Oh, yeah, they weren't built as individual houses, though. They were typically built by a developer who would do, you know, six to a full block at a time. So uh, you can see in the architecture, it's very, very distinctive. Uh, the carvings, the, the bay windows. Beautiful, beautiful brownstones. Brown stone. It's yeah. got the stoop, which uh, the word stoop is actually from the Dutch. The Apollo Theater. Uh -huh. It opened as a burlesque house originally. Wow. And then in 1934, it went to all black uh, programming and became sort of the epicenter of black entertainment. I think what people don't know about New York is that your neighborhood becomes like your little village. You, so I can be in a plane and I'll look down at New York, the buzzing hive of lights, and say, well, I know where I can get my clothes clean, and I know where I can get some great ice cream, yeah. and all that, where people and they know, know you. you. They, yeah, know they know you. you. That's the most important Right, right, they give you that extra scoop of whatever yeah. you like. <laughs> I meet with another Harlem local, Terry Johnson, who has used the Harlem Renaissance's style and grace as inspiration for her own company. Everyone who lives in Harlem loves Harlem. And you're, you're constantly being inspired by, by the creative people who are here, by the restaurants, by the music, by the energy. So all of the candles are inspired by Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance, and jazz legends who have contributed so much to culture and music. I also have a candle called Ellington, which is inspired by the classic gentleman Duke. Then I also have a candle called Holiday, inspired by Billie Holiday. Right. Not just named after Billie Holiday, but there's also some cedar, yeah. some pine, some eucalyptus, some hyacinth. Yeah, so you, mm -hmm. it, you, it's very Christmassy. Mm -hmm. So this is an excerpt of the vintage nightclub map of Harlem. Wow. This was published in Esquire magazine in 1932. Harlem is turning into this again. Mm -hmm. As you can see, Terry is a stylish Harlem local, and to get a better idea of what exactly inspired her to create the Harlem Candle Company, we explore a little bit of the neighborhood's nightlife. She takes me on an evening out to one of her favorite spots, Sylvana. At the corner of 116th and Frederick Douglass Boulevard, this local favorite is a cafe on the street level, while downstairs is a speakeasy-like venue with Moroccan-inspired hookah, Middle Eastern cuisine, and an array of musical acts. Aside from a local singer and rapper, we also catch a Zydeco band from Brooklyn. Falafel, Greek salad, wine, Harlem made One day in Harlem stands out from the rest, Sundays. I head to Red Rooster at the corner of 126th and Malcolm X Boulevard to meet with Marissa Blanc and Caselyn Lawson, managers here at this local hotspot. Founded by celebrity chef Marcus Samuelson, Red Rooster's goal is to feature the traditions and culture of Harlem's community. This includes showcasing Harlem's artists, musicians, and its cuisine. The food is what brings everything together. The restaurant's traditional soul food influences include everything from a homemade cornbread to shrimp and grits. 
The fried yard bird is one of the signature dishes here at Red Rooster, a sampling of how soul food has evolved. We have to get the hot sauce on it, too, and the gravy. I'll try. I, I, I take it. I always try. <laughs> the food pays homage in terms of the southern vibe, right? But then there are lots of cultural influences. We have a lot of African spices, which culturally represents what Rowling's all about. Right, right. The mac and greens, uh, it has collard greens baked into it. Oh, nice. <laughs> I think I hear angels calling right now. They're singing to me. <laughs> when Marcus wanted to open Red Rooster, the biggest thing was to pay respect to Harlem mm -hmm. and to come in and bow and say, I am here, mm -hmm. but I want to be part of from it. here and part of it. Yes. Which is also why he lives in the neighborhood. Right. <laughs> That's amazing. He will always say, we are in a community and we have to be of that community. And so he wanted to represent the heart of Harlem to its truest form. Sundays at Red Rooster also include live music, led by local jazz singer Boncella Lewis. The band entertains the patrons by the front bar, but Boncella always makes her rounds to the main dining area to share her song with every table. Directly downstairs from Red Rooster is its sister restaurant, Ginny's Supper Club. Literally underground, this speakeasy-inspired venue is home to Gospel Sundays, hosted by Vi Higginson and her gospel students of the Mama Foundation for the Arts. Jenny's uh, Sunday Gospel Celebration, and we put the accent on celebration here. <laughs> We believe that every community should have the arts. And without the arts, we are half dead. So that we created this program because so many young people were singing hip hop and R&B, which is all fine. However, we wanted to make sure we balanced the musical menu. And gospel and jazz are a part of our history and our culture and our music, and we never want anybody to forget. So I started this program to make sure that young people between the ages of 13 and 19 would learn the art of gospel and the music that helped so many of our ancestors survive through very difficult times. We believe that singing is a powerful healing force, both for the person who's singing, but also for the person who's receiving. Yeah. So you can be healed by being heard. And when they took the programs out of the school, then that's where we came in. They take the music and the arts out, and these poor musical kids have nowhere to go. Yeah. So we take the musical kids, and then they start to get better at everything, academically, because they are satisfied by being seen and by being heard. It's a big part of what has to happen. I love how the lead singer, she came and she said, welcome to Harlem, USA. Yes. It really, is it, it isn't Harlem, New York. It's Harlem, Harlem USA, USA, you know, yes. because it really is this magical place. It's a magical place. That you cannot recreate anywhere else. You yes. can't find anywhere else. That's it. Rich in history, rich in music, rich in culture, rich in joy and love and just like so much energy. Yes. It is, it's Harlem, USA. It's Harlem, this USA. little pocket. The 
arts are omnipresent in Harlem, alive in its restaurants, in its schools, and even in what used to be our waterways. I head to Harlem Stage, across from St. Nicholas Park on 135th Street, to a space that has cultivated the arts and whose mission is to continue to foster the artists in this community so that the Harlem legacy remains. So Harlem Stage is the name of the organization and the gatehouse is the name of the building. Mm, okay. so this building mm -hmm. it was actually a gatehouse for the Croton Aqueduct system. Mm -hmm. And so during the early 1900s, uh, New York City residents used to be able to come to the gatehouse and actually see water flowing from the Croton Aqueduct system through these viewing stations. Community is essentially what we're all about. Great. So as an institution, we are we have committed ourselves to identifying visionary artists and supporting them uh, through the creation, development, and presentation of their work. Wow. But beyond that, we also have a long-standing commitment of connecting them to community. We believe that education is not just for young people. We believe in lifelong learning. You know, like one of the things that I think that both myself, Harlem Stage, and all of our sister organizations try to debunk is the myth that like Harlem arts and culture has kind of like reached a peak. It is always evolving. Yeah. There was always dynamic art, always dynamic energy, always forward thinking, always innovation. You know, Harlem and innovation, they're synonymous. Yeah. Jason Samuel Smith, tap legend and one of the artists in residence at Harlem Stage, invited me into his home to talk about his career and how growing up in Harlem shaped him as an artist. So this is hard oak wood on the surface. Then underneath is oak plywood. Over 16, 17 years old now. Wow. New York was the perfect platform. And so I was exposed to great art in every genre, dancing, music, um, lyrics, vocals, everything. And eventually my sister saw tap classes and she jumped in it. And when I saw her get in it and how good she was and really how challenging but fun it looked, mm -hmm. I said, hey, I want to try that too. Then once I met some of the great tap dancers in the community at the time, people like Savion Glover and Buster Brown and Leroy Myers, you know, people that were constantly around encouraging the, the next generation, we would go to jazz clubs and hang out with them. Harlem Tavern, Minton's Playhouse, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at club environment, you're being taught by everybody in there. The musicians, the crowd, the soloists, everybody's playing a role and nobody's more important than the other. You're gonna learn the most there then than you would, more than you would in a dance studio where you're just in a room full of people with one person instructing. When you teach, because you teach, sure. you actually start with improvisation. Sure. So what I believe is that, you know, even with no vocabulary in tap, you can improvise. Okay. Because if you, you have a heartbeat, obviously, right. if you're alive, that's the first rhythm and the first beat you feel. Mm -hmm. Even if you just tap out your heartbeat. You keep right. adding different sounds or ideas within that, that can be your structure. Let's just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, <laughs> three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's different when you're being told what to do all the time. I'll point your foot and let me see that arm and your back's not straight. Yes, there is, a, there is something about that kind of discipline that can get you to a very high level. Mm -hmm. But that has a plateau. Yeah. Improv has no plateau. So once you discover that, you're like, well, I can do this until I die and I can do what I want. Yeah.
I, I fell in love with the with the people in the art form. I fell in love with the possibilities, with the potential, you know, and and just the activity. I mean, it's it's addicting. You know, you dance, you feel good. It gives you a high. You know, the awards or accolades or anything that I've gotten, it just comes from my dedication. Once I committed to being a part of this art form full time and putting everything I have behind it. I've been all about the people in the art, you know, celebrating the elders, celebrating the, the, the culture and the history of this. Is, it's a special thing. Harlem may have gone through many changes since its first renaissance in the 20s and 30s, but from what I see, hear, feel, and taste now, this incredible community continues to inspire and create with no end in sight. The beautiful openness of this neighborhood, architecturally and culturally, is something that I've yet to see anywhere else in New York City. Harlem is a special place that I truly hope never loses its authenticity, its vibrant energy, and its colorful people. And I'll see you on my next Bare Feet in NYC adventure, wherever it may take me. You can stay connected with us on TravelBareFeet.com, where you'll find extra bonus videos, join our Bare Feet series conversations through social media, and stay updated with our newsletter.